say you are what you eat, so I don't eat chicken feet. But I love me some of Grandma's pickled beets. Well, cut it up, put it in the pan, throw it over your shoulder and see where it lands right here in the farmer's kitchen. Maters, taters, beans and corn, the cows in the barn and the sheep's been shorn. Kids in the barnyard chasing Grandpa's chicken. Chicken, chicken. Spices, slices, cuts and dices, gonna slash your grocery prices right here in the farmer's kitchen. Help you grow your garden good with recipes to suit your mood. Try some grub you've never tried before. Smash it with a wooden mallet, gonna educate your palate. Right here in Farmer's Kitchen, in town Farmer's Country Kitchen. We're gonna cook something good now. Hello and welcome to Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. Well, hello, Mrs. Farmer. How did you get here? I came with the steak. <laughs> you know what? We're cooking outside today. We, we have a kind of a, a unique show today. We get asked so many questions. Right. And sometimes I think it's important that we should go ahead and answer some of those questions, which we're going to do today. The ones that we use on the show, we're going to put them in our hat. We're going to pull the winner out. We'll probably do eight or ten questions. Okay. And whoever wins, we're going to get some Lodge cookware. Oh, wow. Never been used brand new Lodge cookware. Can I enter? Can I ask a you question? Can. You've got all the logic okay. you need. I see. I got a question. But you know who I saw today that Who'd you, you haven't seen in a while? Who? Guess. I, um, Think about where <gasps> Murphy. You went Murphy. to see Murphy. I went to see Murphy How today. How is he? Did he ask about me? He was. He shed a little Murphy tear. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, if you don't remember Murphy, that was your Christmas present. That's right. Last Christmas. Mm -hmm. So he's over a year old. It's time for his training to begin. How's he doing? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> he's doing pretty good. Okay. Now he's just started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a pretty amazing process. What I want him to do is when we have sheep out in the field, we let them out of their nightly enclosure. All I want him to do is go in and kind of round them up and bring them back. He doesn't have to go eight miles out in the woods and, and you know, do all fancy yeah. tricks. So we went to check on Murphy today. Okay. You were here. You didn't get to see this, but it was pretty amusing. These dogs are so smart. <laughs> and Scott has been handling these dogs since way back in the 1990s. So he knows his stuff. Hmm. And he's got a partner named Hansel, who okay. helps him out. So you want to see how today worked out? I do. I'd out? like to see it. It was that. pretty interesting. I miss Murph. We're in Chicken Gizzard today. That's correct. With Scott. Chicken Gizzard. Why can't I live in a place called Chicken Gizzard? Well, it's not as lucky as I am, I guess. <laughs> no, it's, it's next to what? It lays in between Dry Creek and Gum Lick. And what's the next holler over? Uh, the next ridge over is Possum Tribe. I love Kentucky. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's neat. You know what? I have known you for a while. You're mm -hmm. Todd's brother. Mm -hmm. But through uh, many different interests that you have and things that you do, first of all, you build fences. I had you come over and build fences. And you did a daggone good job. Thank you. Nobody's got out. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, the one thing that I got to talking to you about, though, is I have Murphy. Mm -hmm. And I knew that you trained dogs, but I had I'd forgotten that you, 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 this is what you do. And you have a partner. Hansel Scott. Hansel mm -hmm. does this mm -hmm. as well. So here we are. I said, do you think you can do anything with this dog? And you yeah. said, I think we can. And so you took Murphy. He'd never done anything. I was afraid to try anything because, I, you know, I worked with bird dogs. And it's not the same thing. Right. All of them have some natural instinct. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been working with these dogs? Well, I trained a lot back in the 90s. Yeah. And I quit. And then Tanya and I have been married for 10 years. We trained for about three years when we first married and then kind of got burnt out on it. And we just started back up about two months ago. Right. So not going to get too serious about it as far as a lot of dogs. We used right. to keep, you know, anywhere from 10 to 14 oh, dogs. Wow. But we're not going to get that serious about it. So what is the first step? First of all, I guess you want to introduce them to stock and see what their reaction is. That's right. Am I correct mm -hmm. there? You just, it's all about reading the dog. Right. He'll tell you what he's ready for. Right. And it's especially important with these pups. Now you've actually brought some dogs out today you are going to run through some paces. First of all, you got to have stock. Right. Obviously. Mm -hmm. And what happens in this little ring right here? Well, th this is more for our benefit than it is the dog. Right. This is so that we can control the situation right. and stay ahead of the dog. If we was out in this four and a half acre field that we're standing in, you know, we're going to give out trying to run things down. Sure. Well, can we see some some mm -hmm. working? Sure we can. Yeah, let's watch it. You're going to hear me say away to me 
and come by. Away to me is the counterclockwise command. Come by is the clockwise command. Now typically when we're training, we don't, uh, we don't use both flanks in the same lesson. She's got about a good solid month of training on her. Maybe, maybe five weeks. If she had a report card, what would she be getting grade-wise? She's a pretty nice dog. She's probably, she's a B. Yeah, there, you'll see some with maybe a little, just a tick more natural talent. Uh, but she's pretty nice, she's a pretty nice pup. I'm just kind of tapping this stick to let her know I'm still here, you know. Because there's, the only thing keeping these dogs from maybe hurting stock is us. You know, the discipline we put on them. So their instinct is to go get them. Just oh yeah, the, their instinct is to go to them. Now yeah. the more natural they are, the more their instinct is to go gather them, put them together, <laughs> and uh, pack it out. Put them together and 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 put them somewhere. Maybe not necessarily right. with you, but put them together. Right. That's the more natural dogs. But as you can see, she's she's a pretty nice pup. Um, this this pup probably. A 10 or 15 minute lesson at this stage of the game wouldn't be too much for sure. Uh, but she, but she got to bear in mind, she, she's not even, she won't be a year old till May. So she's just a baby. You know, we got to, we have to handle her pretty easy. And you probably see here too, when they go in or out of a gate, they lay down. Huh. Then that way, when we start going to a field one of these days, they go into the field and say they're off lead. You know, she's she's got no control, but no chance, no choice but to stay with me here today. But you know, the more and more we'll get to trusting her, and we'll keep her off lead more. Right. But we want her to lay down when she comes in gotcha. and wait for wait for us to tell her what to do. That'll do. That'll do. Now, who's this dog? This is Dan. This is a full litter mate brother to Ann that was just in the pen. Gotcha. He's already to the stage, I don't really have to do a lot of blocking. So right. if I go over here, he brings them to me. Yeah. You know, there's nothing to keep me from taking sheep to liberty, you know, yeah. with this dog. Now he's just in orbit right now, but I'm gonna step out here, block him. So he's, bring, he's bringing stock to me, even though we're in a little tight pen. Now you gave Ann a B, what'd you give this cat right here? I'd probably have to say a B on him as well. He started a lot better than Ann, but Ann's kind of coming up. You can't, you can't knock them too much. I mean, they're really pretty, pretty nice pups. So what do you have with Murphy? Murphy has, uh, he's, he's kind of unique in some ways. Okay. He wants to go straight onto the stock. Okay. All right, that presents a bit of a challenge. Now, when you say that, I mean, he's just... Straight on. Yeah, the only thing keeping right him out. from hurting stock is us. You know, we're going to block him and keep him off of him. So right now it's just brutal instinct wanting to get at those animals. It's right. It's more of a wolf type instinct yeah. though. He likes to work when it's on his his terms. See how he's not wanting to look at me? Things aren't just, just exactly right in his mind. He's not figured out yet that he's working for me. He thinks I'm working for him. And you know, that's not how it is. So that'll get better. It's just a difference in dogs. And and you have to treat them all as individuals. Sure. So, yeah, Doug's got bees, so what are we talking here? He's a, uh, he's a D minus. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but at least, at least. We're gonna tutor him up though. <laughs> at least he didn't get an F. That's right. So there's hope. There's hope. Yeah, we're gonna make it. He's got drive. I mean, he wants, like you, when you yeah. tell me on the phone, there's no problem with him going to stock. He right. wants to go to stock. I see what you're saying. Right. But what I saw with the other dogs, who got a better grade, much better grade than them, is when, when it was time to lie down, mm -hmm. they were still looking at you and the sheep. Right. Murphy's like, hey, what's up, man? Yeah. He's he, looking over He here. thinks I'm picking on him still, but uh -huh. we're gonna get past him. Yeah. yeah. Interesting stuff. Well, man, thank you so much time thank for taking you. time Appreciate out today. It. Beautiful day. Although the sun did go behind the cloud, yeah. it's getting cool. I'm gonna have to go home and build a fire there and cook go. me a huge steak. Uh-oh. You think yeah. it's a good idea? I think it is. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Now, that leads us to being over the fire. We're going to cowboy cook tonight. But before we do that, we are going to answer a few questions. And by the way, do you think this will be enough meat for both of us? I think so. Well, I don't know. You like your steak. I hope it, I hope it does. I hope it works. I think it'll work. Now, if you'll notice, because this is a cowboy cooking segment, that I'm using an, an absolute, genuine 1890s 
cell phone, just like really? Cowboys had back, yeah, back in the That's day. That's interesting. They would have texted each other uh -huh. on the same yeah. exact antique mm -hmm. phone. Wow. Yeah. Right. Tim Hutchins is the one who inspired me to do this because we had so many questions. He says, mm -hmm. okay, Tim, who taught you how to cook? We need a show about the people who influenced you to cook. So that's pretty interesting and it makes you go deep within the old brain and pull some stuff out. Obviously mom and dad, my grandparents, and the church ladies. The church ladies. Who, who influenced you? My parents too, and grandparents. Grandparents. Right, learn from them. Now, I remember going down south as a kid and we'd have these long meetings and we'd have association meetings. So we'd go to Alabama. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because we got to go different places as a kid to church. But these ladies, they would call it, and I, something to do with eating on the ground or something. They would pull out all these dishes. And their best dishes. Their, all best, their dishes, best dishes. Yes. Because all these people came from all around the association. Right. It was a Baptist deal. They would all come out with these great dishes. And you know, as a kid, <laughs> you know, I could eat 80,000 pounds of food because I'm pretty sure I had worms. What yes, do you, you do. Do you remember any church ladies? That I had do. Then they have the best cookbooks too. Oh, they Those do. Church ladies. That's Those true. The books I like to, oh, they had good stuff. Of course, mom and dad were great cooks. Right. And dad cooked a lot in the kitchen as well. My grandfather liked to cook kind of odd and bizarre things at the time, you know, tomato preserves, yeah. things like that, which, you know, tomato preserves, mm -hmm. he'd eat it over ice cream. <laughs> really weird yeah, good, things that's at the good time, thinking, but it though. was good. Yeah. All the relishes and all the things that we smelled around the house. My great grandmother, Carr, she cooked a lot of wild game because she I would go that. down to Floyd's Fork and catch catfish. Mm -hmm. She would shoot squirrels up into her 70s. <laughs> so that was, that was where the wild game came from. But later in life, in the 1990s, may have been in the late 80s, early 90s, I met Raoul Dupree. Raoul was this amazing French chef who came to visit his daughter, who was our neighbor, and we got to talking. Most fascinating. You've heard about the uh, uh, the most interesting man alive. They used to have the beer commercial. Yeah. That guy had nothing on Raoul. <laughs> Raoul went on French polar expeditions. He had a restaurant in Casablanca with a swimming pool, a staff of 60. You got to hang out with him. Cooked for the king of Morocco, and he kind of adopted me as his son. On one of, on one of the shows we did way back on Kentucky Field, he says, you're like my son. And my oh, little sweet. heart went pitter, yeah. pitter, 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 pitter. But he would show me sauces and how to mix spices you and good how sauces. to smell things. Mm -hmm. and, and he told me, I asked him, I said, am I, would I be a good chef? He says, so we went through all these things. And he says that my nose, he said I could track game. He's telling the truth too. So Raoul Dupree was our biggest, to me, biggest influence and what a wonderful guy. Who was yours? My, both my grandmas were great cooks. Well, they were. They were wonderful. And we cooks. still have the recipes yes, that we, we do. Yes, we do. My one grandma had a restaurant. My other grandma just, that's all she did was cook. I think she was at 12 years old cooking for the family. So she had great recipes. Okay, here's two more. Danny Cook. Okay. So this is probably a question that's asked a lot okay. on YouTube, Facebook, and emails, and so on and so forth. Because we have new viewers all the time. We mm -hmm. like that. But this is Danny Cook. Why do you keep your hand wrapped in a glove? That's a good question. That's, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a legitimate question because it is always in a glove because I have nerve damage. So let's go back a while to about 1984. I was a young Marine, had a motorcycle, was off for leave to see mom and dad, had a tragic motorcycle accident. I hit some gravel, went under a guardrail, and boom, cut my arm off. Just a tiny little bit was holding me together. I was taken to a hospital. I almost lost my life, almost bled to death. I had other injuries as well. We won't talk about all that, but long story short, they put me back together. I thought I was gonna lose my arm there for a while. I didn't. They established blood flow, but it was really, really, really torn up. It wasn't cut, it was ripped. So they put me back together, put metal in this arm, and I have a lot of atrophy. This arm is really small compared to this arm due to lack of use. And I have a condition called RSD, which makes it gives it a burning sensation all the time, which is really aggravating, trust me. Yeah. But if it's cold, it really, really hurts. So that's why I always have the glove on. And the actual brace is to kind of help hold my wrist in that position. So the follow-up question, Tom Gross says, do you miss doing Kentucky a field? That was a big part of your life. That was a big part of my life. Yeah. 
I started with the Department of Fish and Wildlife in the late 1980s. You had mustache, didn't you then? Just a yeah, mustache. Yeah, I was a goober. <laughs> I was a real goober, trust me. Glad you were cute. <laughs> <laughs> so I started in fisheries. I went to school and I, and I studied biology and history. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure which one I was going to do when I found out there was a job opening in Frankfurt as a fisheries person and I was like man I would love to do that you know mess around with fish setting, right. you know electro fishing and dipping them up and now during that time I was I had already figured out how to shoot a gun off my right shoulder I had already figured out how to fly fish with my just my left hand and strip the line out with my teeth and to reel mm -hmm. big Pretty bass in with my teeth figured all that out but one thing that really broke my heart is I couldn't shoot a bow and arrow anymore so one day a friend of mine Billy Mitchell from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, came in and he knew that, you know, it was hurting wanted, me that yeah. I couldn't shoot a bow and arrow. And he was kind enough to think about this and he brought in a magazine of a guy named Biff out on the West Coast in Washington Biff. State. His name was Biff. <laughs> he said, look at this guy right here for me. He said, he's shooting a bow with his teeth. I said, you can't shoot a bow with your teeth. You break your front teeth out. He says, no, Farmer, you can do this. He says, use your jaw teeth. So we cut out a little piece of leather I bought me a bow off the shelf at Walmart, the cheap, yeah. cheapest one they had. In a matter of an afternoon, I was shooting a group like that. So I was trying to get the bow faster so I could compete with some of these, these guys who were shooting really fast bows with really long draw lengths. So I was pulling 80 pounds with my teeth. So right now, let's just take a minute and show how that actually works. And over the years, there have been hundreds and hundreds of people that I've been able to help yeah. through showing, and there's a little girl that's doing this right now that's really doing well across Good. the United States. So I've helped all kinds of folks, and it's so wonderful to be able to have this information out there. So maybe someone's going to see this that's never done this before, but here's how I shoot a bow and arrow. So over the years, I had to figure out how to do things with one arm. Now, I've showed this before, and over the years with the Kentucky Field, hundreds and hundreds of bow hunting segments. We're going to show you how to do this up close. Basically, I have a tab on my string. Grab it like this. It's about a 70 pound bow. Pull back like so. Then I simply look through the peep sight. That's how that works. Now, just to show you that that wasn't a fluke, we'll try one more. So once again, mouth tab, just attached, served into the string. Bite on that, pull back, release. Okay, this one's from Nana, and I hope you pr I pronounce this right, M-A-T-T-I-E, Matai, Matei? Maybe. Tim and Nikki, what's each of your favorite food or meal that you remember from your childhood? You know, I don't know if y'all did this or not, but as a kid, there were certain nights, mom had kind of a routine. Right. And, you know, I remember cabbage dishes. I remember, you know what I just remembered? Hmm. Mom's vegetable soup. Yum. Outstanding. She made it like a vegetable stew. Mm -hmm. um, I remember her spaghetti. Mm -hmm. I remember her liver and onions. Did you have tuna fish sandwiches too? Oh, yeah. That was Constantly. always, yeah. But not for dinner. Lunch. Was that was always lunch your lunch. Um, we grew up a lot alike, didn't we? Yes, we did. It's just <laughs> kind of scary. are a lot alike. What else? I remember the spaghetti like you. And roast. Yeah, always roast on Sunday. Roast on roast Sunday. Roast potatoes and carrots. Yeah, we had the, and I loved everything. Isn't that funny? And I still love liver and so do you. Oh, <laughs> liver and onions, you can't beat it. So that was some of our favorite stuff. But dessert wise, my mom, she made this chocolate cake with chocolate icing. I know you I don't know that. what she did, but it's magic. She had this fudge crust and then the, the cake was real moist <laughs> and dark chocolate. Oh. Yummy. It's delicious. You need some now? What was, what was your mom's She favorite? made all kinds of desserts. What, which one was your favorite? I think rice pudding. And her dad and mom taught her. It's my favorite. I still, the kids love it. I still make it. It's so simple and delicious. You know what? Let's break from the questions for just a minute. we got some good questions to answer. We're going to make a potato dish. It's kind of a scallop potato type recipe. And here's the overview. It's really pretty easy. So what we're going to do is we're going to saute some onions. We're gonna take those and just saute large rings and cut them in half in butter, right over the open fire. When we get those nice and brown, translucent, we're gonna take the potatoes, thinly slice them, 
Put those in there and just get a little bit of brown on them. And then we're going to take a little bit of mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. Mayonnaise is great. And then we're going to take some cheese and what we have, some Swiss and some extra sharp. And we're just going to turn that over and let that melt in there. Yum. Salt, pepper, a little bit of garlic. It's absolutely wonderful. It's a quick good. and easy dish. You could also do this in your 10 inch. Mm -hmm. and you could even put some breadcrumbs over the top and Yum. make it absolutely delicious. But tonight, you want to time your stuff out so it goes accordingly. There's nothing like a big old hunk of steak over that kind of fire right there. That's the perfect fire for steak. I got a hickory log right on there. It's going to impart that hickory flavor into that. I'm starving. I'm going to get a good sear on both sides. <laughs> I'm, ready. I'm ready. And we'll just hold on the bone and just arr, arr, arr. Will you let me have any? I will let you have some. A bite, okay. I'm like that. Now the last thing we're going to do is we're going to take our asparagus. This doesn't take any time at all. We're just going to take this fresh asparagus. We're going to take some bacon and we're going to wrap around that asparagus. We're going to lay that on the open fire, kind of off to the side. Or we could even use our skillet. We could use a skillet to keep it. I'm falling oh. over. That sounds yummy. Where'd you get your cowboy hat? You bought it for me. Since we're cowboy cooking, that's, that's right. where our cowboy hat. That's right. Good okay. stiff wind might blow me away. Uh oh. Don't but do you know what? We got a cowboy steak. That smells good. Now you good. saw what happened, and you saw it in real time. That was quick and easy. I wish mm -hmm. you could smell what we're smelling. It's when nasty. is the asparagus done? When the bacon's done? My mouth is watering. I can't hardly talk. Look at this plate. <sighs> Look at the beauty they're in. It's yummy. We're gonna let this rest for about five minutes. Then you're gonna cut into it. Now we like ours rare. And so I want grill marks. First of all, I want to make sure if I got a good grill mark, that means it's good and hot. Those are good grill marks. To me, some of the best seasoning on a steak is the simplest. Sometimes you get a steak that's like, why did they put all this yeah. in there? It's too complicated, it's too much. Right. This is salt, pepper, garlic, period. Perfect. Purely simple, but beautiful. That is beautiful. Now since that's resting, let's do one more question. Amy Siska asks, what inspired you to start buying locally produced food and raising your own food? And that goes hand in hand with Heather Jones' question, what made you want to do a TV show together about country living and eating. Whose idea was it? Well, it was my idea. I had to drag her in. She did not want to be a part of this. That's right. Thank goodness she did, because she makes the show that much better. You know what? I had this idea a long time ago, and that, that was, the first question was, what made you want to do locally produced foods? Well, right. we've always done that, because we would go out and catch fish, mm -hmm. or I would shoot a deer, or we would I'd shoot a bear and mm -hmm. eat the bear. We were all about taking wild game, whether it be squirrels, rabbits, so on and so forth, and bringing that in as part of our diet. Right. So as far as the locally grown and produced, we grow as much as we can. If we can't grow it, we know some folks who do. Right. So that's how that all started. And the idea for the show came out of the interest I already had. We were already canning venison, and people right. would react to that and say, well, can you can something else? Well, not really on Kentucky Field because it was a hunting and fishing show. I did a show with Bill Dixon, <laughs> the traditions mm -hmm. to keep these things alive. Bill, I want to talk to him about how he used to eat ham and how he used to remember going out and cutting it right, right off out of the smokehouse mm -hmm. and eating a seven-year-old ham. And still good. And still good. And, and you know, I thought, man, how many Bill Dixons are there out there? How many Bobby Joe and Lois Ellis right. are there out there? How many Miss Helens are there out mm -hmm. there? So. Along with what we're doing here, we're trying to find those folks and preserve those traditions right. in Kentucky. It's great questions, but we've answered so many questions <laughs> that I'm starving now. Me too. So go ahead and cut into that. Let's see what we can find. Now look at that. We got wow. sear on the top, sear on the bottom. Cooked perfect. Now that's a warm red center. Mm. Mm. You taste that hickory? That's delicious. Yum. I've had a lot of good steaks, but I'm telling you what over the fire, the taste that you get from the wood. Amazing. You can't beat it. You know what? The day's almost over. Mm -hmm. In fact, the camera light's blinking, which means the battery's already shot, uh -oh. which means we gotta wrap this thing up, Mr. Right. Farmer. So if you wanted to find a recipe like that, where would you go? I go to timfarmerscountrykitchen.com. No, you don't. Yes, I do. What do you find over there? I find recipes. I find all kinds of stuff. You can watch shows. You can do everything. There. Kelly actually made us measure everything out so you, yes, can, you, did. you can follow our directions <laughs> there. So when you're on our YouTube page and you're looking up recipes and you want to follow us and you want to 
get a notice right. when we got new stuff out, what would you do? I hit subscribe. A little red button, boom, hit it, you're on. <laughs> also, our Facebook page, we want you to be our Facebook friend. We talk to folks on there, we share stuff. This is how we got questions tonight. Right. How do you be a part of that? You hit like. That's it, boom, and you're on. Mrs. Farmer, we gotta wrap this thing up. And we do, because I wanna eat. What's it all about? Good times. Good friends. And let's pick this up and eat. Let's do you it. We'll do see that? you next week with a brand new Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. You want a bite? Well, of course I do. To order a cookbook, please call 502-319-0487 or email timfarmerck at gmail.com.